Welcome to Uncommons. I'm Nate Erskine-Smith, and on this episode I'm joined by Erwin Kotler, a former professor, former parliamentarian, and minister of justice, and the founder and current chair of the Raoul Wallenberg Center for Human Rights. He is a giant in the field of human rights, most notably as a defender of political prisoners, including as Canadian counsel for Nelson Mandela. Now, as a younger parliamentarian, I have an incredible respect for his life's work, and particularly his call for all of us to take our responsibility to the world more seriously. Erwin joins me to speak about the work of the Wallenberg Center and human rights concerns around the world. Erwin, thank you for joining me. Pleasure, Nate. I read that you attended a minor league ball game and watched Jackie Robinson at the age of six, and that that was quite an impactful experience for you. I never got to see Jackie Robinson, obviously, but I'll tell you, just reading about Jackie Robinson's experiences when I was in grade seven and eight had a huge impact on me. So I can only imagine the impact that it had on you actually seeing him in action and learning of his story. Well, uh, my father was a big baseball fan and, and he took me to the Lorimier Stadium in Montreal, which is where the then Montreal Royals played later to become the Montreal Expos. And he took me because he wanted me to see at that point, Jackie Robinson. And as I said, I mentioned I was a six year old, but Jackie Robinson was a black American who became a, a star and then went straight up to play at that top point with the Brooklyn Dodgers. But that was my introduction, not only to Jackie Robinson as a great ball player, but my father introduced Jackie Robinson as, as in effect, epitomizing the struggle of equality for blacks. And baseball was one of the breakthroughs at the time. And so it, it was a looking glass, really, into the civil rights movement in the States. And part of my family was living in Brooklyn at the time. And I used to go visit there with my father. Later on, I went and and, and studied in the States and became involved in the civil rights movement. But Jackie Robinson was, was the initial looking glass, the inspiration for understanding that struggle, for understanding the courage and bravado in that struggle, because he had to en endure you know, all kinds of ugly epithets and the like. I have to say that Montreal was a good place for him to break in because he had support in the city at the time, which perhaps helped buffet him when he went up to play in the major leagues and had to uh, then uh, endure some of the ugly epithets when he played in, in some of the places in, in the U.S., which were far less friendly than uh, the Lormier Stadium was for him in Montreal. You've spoken powerfully about Nelson Mandela being a metaphor in some ways for hope and the struggle for equality. And some of those same attributes, obviously, we see with the story of Jackie Robinson as well, where it was about him, but it wasn't only about him. Yeah, Ma Mandela really showed how one person could endure 27 years in a South African prison and then emerge to not only become the first president of a free, egalitarian, multiracial South Africa, but really to bring in democracy, equality, and one of the most progressive bills of rights of any country in the world. So person who endured what he did to come out without any rancor, without any sense of revenge, but still with hope and inspiration, really a role model for our times. And from the six-year-old who watched that Montreal ball game to then a professor of human rights in the 1980s, you yourself were in South Africa, and while you weren't detained for 27 years, you did suffer detainment from a presentation you gave on Nelson Mandela and, and his cause? Well, what happened was I, I came to South Africa as a, a guest of the anti-apartheid struggle at, at the time. It was in 1981. I had then been representing a Soviet political prisoner, Anatoly Sharansky. When I came there, I actually had, at that point, the support, if you will, of the apartheid government because they were condemning the Soviet Union, but the anti-apartheid movement saw in uh, Sharansky a hero of the struggle for human rights. So some students at the University of Wattwarsan Law School asked me if I'd give a talk on the Sharansky case, because that's what was resonating. I said, well, look, I'd, I'd like to talk about Sharansky, but I really would like to talk about Mandela, and maybe we can do something if, if Sharansky, why not Mandela? I said, but I know Mandela is a banned person. I don't want to get in, any of you guys into trouble. And, and there was a very courageous law student at the time, Neville Eisenberg, I still remember, he said, no, 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 we'll go ahead, we'll do it. And they organized this gathering, which I'm told to today is one of the largest gatherings ever had uh, at Witwatersrand. I gave my talk, and at the end of the talk, as my wife would uh, tell you, because she went up to speak with me, but I had been disappeared because I was arrested because of the fact that I spoke about Mandela, who was a banned person. But 
and a very quick, interesting sequence as to what happened afterwards. When I was being detained, I was asked by the warden if I knew Pitt Bota, who was then the foreign minister of South Africa. And I said, no. He said, well, he's asked us to bring you to him. And I came into his office in Pretoria, and he looked at me, and he said, well, young man, you're probably wondering why I asked to see you. And I said, yes. And he pointed to a picture on his wall, and he said, you know who that is, don't you? I said, yes, that's Anatoly Sharansky. He said, right. He said, on his I wall. Could, on his wall. He said, I couldn't understand how somebody like you, who could be representing a great hero like Anatoly Sharansky, who's fighting against our enemy, the Communist Soviet Union, in the same breath, could speak of our other enemy, Nelson Mandela, who's also a communist. So I said, well, Mr. Bota, both Mandela and Sharansky are fighting for the same thing. They're both fighting for freedom. They're both fighting for democracy. Then he went on to try and tell me how South Africa, an apartheid state, really represented a democracy. This went on for about two and a half hours. I won't bore a burden you other than to say that at the end of this, I said to him, well, Mr. Bota, I have to tell you, I know that the Soviet Union is a major human rights violator, but South Africa is the only post-World War II country that has institutionalized racism as a matter of law, apartheid is not just a racist philosophy. It's a racist legal regime. And for so long as it takes from wherever I, I am, I'm going to fight against this racist legal regime until it is dismantled. Then he referred to me as a brash young man, which is what he kept calling me during the conversation. The rest is history. I don't want to take your time, but it, it was interesting how the two cases intersected in the way they did. Well, then fast forward. I don't want to skip over your parliamentary career. When I, when I was reading your bio and I saw that you'd won your initial by-election with 92%. I thought they were dictator numbers, but I saw that <laughs> it came they... down over time. Your last election, you only won by 55%. <laughs> yeah, no. you know, my, my, my son said, better not run again, Dad, the way things have been going for you. You're going to get turfed out. Leave while you can. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I regret you leaving because I haven't had an opportunity to work with you directly. And I think many of us newbies in 2015 would have, would have gained a lot of insight. And I think it's really important that we, we learn from folks who have done so much in the course of their careers before Parliament, but also their parliamentary careers. But now, post-Parliament, you have opted to continue public service, continue public life as a strong advocate for human rights and, and really pushing to defend and, and free political prisoners. Your new center, can you tell me the story behind the name? Yeah, the, the, the center was named uh, in memory of, and I would say in tribute to Raoul Wallenberg, who's Canada's first honorary citizen, sometimes referred to as the hero of the Holocaust or the hero of humanity, who demonstrated how one person with the compassion to care and the courage to act can confront evil, prevail, and thereby transform history. Uh, let me just give one quick datum which demonstrates this. From mid-May to the beginning of July 1944, the Nazis at the time deported some 440,000 Hungarian Jews to the death camps in Auschwitz, the, the cruelest, most efficient killing field in all of the Holocaust. Wallenberg arrived in the Swedish legation in Budapest in mid-July uh, 1944. And from mid-July 44 to the end of 44, he was responsible through bravado and bluff and mobilizing others, etc., for the saving of the remnant of 100,000 Jews. So what all the world community could not do as a bystander community, one person, as I said, with the compassion to care and the courage to act, transformed history. So that's why we named our center after our first honorary citizen. I just received a piece of correspondence from your center that highlighted a number of different issues, and I wouldn't mind walking through the various different campaigns that you have underway. I recently spoke to Professor Carvin at Carleton about the Uyghurs and the potential use of sanctions, and I wonder if you could speak a little bit about the work that your center has undertaken and the atrocities currently underway for those who are less familiar of the Uyghurs in China. Well, a, a very important article was published in, in Foreign Policy magazine uh, over a month ago by the legal center, Yona Diamond, along with uh, Rehan Akbar, who's herself a Uyghur as a senior fellow at the Wallenberg Center. Her brother uh, was disappeared in Xinjiang province, and they both wrote an article which is one of the first to have been published. They spoke of what was happening to the Uyghurs as not only constitutive of mass atrocities and crimes against humanity, but arguably, in fact, constituted acts of genocide. And it's a very, very compelling evidence-based article. It demonstrated how not only are there more than one million Uyghurs that have been subjected to mass incarceration 
surveillance, uh, silencing, repression, starvation, and the like. But that in Xinjiang province, they have also been subjected to mass sterilization to prevent births. And at the same time that they've imported uh, hundreds of thousands of Han Chinese. So you have, on, on the one hand, a dramatic reduction within two years of 84% of the population in, in Xinjiang of childbearing age have been subjected to mass uh, sterilization. And at the same time, uh, the forced gathering of, of Han Chinese to replace the ones who have been uh, removed and imprisoned and disappeared. So this is part also, which is sometimes lost, of a massive assault on the identity, the culture, the language, the religion of the Uyghurs. So when you take all these things together, along with the fact that a half a million Uyghur children have been separated uh, from their parents, and you add this to the mass uh, sterilizations and the mass assaults on their identity and the demonization of them as well, then you're really seeing acts constitute of a, a genocide. So the question then becomes, you know, what then can or, or must we do? And just as the Canadian Parliament, uh, the first to, in fact, uh, define what was happening to the Rohingya as being a genocide, we should be taking the lead and doing the same now in exposing the pain and plight of the Uyghurs who are being subjected to acts that effectively constitute genocide, and to take the necessary actions to address and redress it. Number one, it's shocking that we have yet to impose Magnitsky sanctions on any of the leaders involved in that genocidal crime. Canada, to its credit, you know, adopted global Magnitsky legislation, and we've implemented sanctions against Venezuelans, against Russians, against Saudi Arabians, against Myanmar, but not one Chinese official has had any Magnitsky sanction. And I'm speaking here not only with regard uh, to the Uyghurs. I mean, recently we commemorated the 21st anniversary of the launching of what CCP called the Eradication Campaign against the Falun Gong. And I was part of a group that conveyed to the Canadian government 17 Chinese officials documented evidence of their involvement in the persecution and the prosecution of the Falun Gong. And we've had both the Falun Gong and the Uyghurs themselves have been subjected to forced pillaging, forced organ transplanting. And the recently decision of the China Human Rights Tribunal, which was set up under Sir Jeffrey Neist, said that these two constituted crimes against humanity. So in the face of what's been happening to the Falun Gong, in the face of what's been happening to the Uyghurs, let alone the national security legislation imposed on, on Hong Kong, which not only is subjecting Hong Kongers to criminalization, but it has internationalized the nature of the offense because it makes foreign collusion also a criminal offense. In the light of all of this fundamental assault, persistent and pervasive assault on what we like to call a rules-based international order, not one Magnitsky sanction against one Chinese official for any of these assaults. So I think that's something that I would hope the Canadian parliament and, and government would begin to enact, as well as I said, affirming the atrocities as being constitutive of genocide, sanctioning those who are in, involved in forced labor of their Canadian corporations that are connected to that. We just had a call on our inner parliamentary alliance on China, and reference was brought with regard to the Uyghurs. And the question came up, should we be participating in the forthcoming Olympics in China? And the reason I mentioned this is that in 2008, I at the time put out a brief identifying 11 categories of human rights violations by the Chinese authorities at the time and saying that these were standing violations of the Olympic Charter and we should not even then in 2008 go to the Olympics. Well, not only did the Olympics take place, but violations of human rights took place by China on the occasion of the Olympics. And what we documented then pales in comparison to what is happening now. Beyond Magnitsky sanctions, raising public attention, sanctioning Canadian companies, companies over which we have any purview legally whatsoever that are participating and complicit in the human rights violations in China. The additional work that needs to happen is continuing to build out partnerships through multilateralism to ensure that it's not just the US, Canada, and the UK that has 
this Magnitsky regime, but in order for it to be especially effective, adding other countries, Australia, I know, is undertaking some work now, but adding other countries to adopt a similar framework. Yes, in fact, uh, I just on a conversation just yesterday with Senator Kimberly Keating from Australia, you just were mentioning, or she's part of also the Interparliamentary Alliance, and we were discussing the fact that we need to replicate the Interparliamentary Alliance on China, which brings together parliamentarians from over 20 countries, including uh, from Southeast Asia, from Japan, and the like. We need to replicate it with an intergovernmental alliance, because it's easy for China to seek to bully one country at a time, whether it be Canada or Australia. But it'd be much more difficult if we had an intergovernmental alliance to thereby put an end to the bullying, and we can work together in, in concert in that regard. Probably our first interaction was in relation to the Magnitsky Act, where initially our government had not been so strongly supportive, and then thankfully that quickly changed. But the issue of targeted sanctions comes up in so many different contexts. So you've mentioned a few different instances that would warrant targeted sanctions against Chinese officials. You were also part of a panel recently where Amal Clooney being the chair with respect to media freedoms has recommended targeted sanctions where journalists are imprisoned, killed in many cases. So I was shocked to learn in a quarter of cases of journalists who have been murdered, it's government officials that are suspected of of being involved. And then in Venezuela, you mentioned Canada has undertaken targeted sanctions, which stand in contrast to American sanctions, where we know that broader sanctions harm the very people we want to help in in some cases. And so the importance of targeted sanctions against the individuals culpable, they're all the more important as a a policy tool. The thing about the Magnitsky sanctions that distinguishes them is that they're not sanctions that are targeting any particular country or targeting any particular government. They are sanctions targeting individuals who have been involved in what are characterized as gross human rights violations like torture, extrajudicial executions, and the like. I remember when we had Boris Nemtsov, the then leader of the Russia democracy, he came to Canada to support my private member's bill, Reed Magnitsky sanctions that I introduced then in the fall of 2011. It took a while till the thing became law. But I remember Boris Nemtsov, who tragically was then assassinated in Russia, right near the Kremlin, because he had been a leader in advocating for Magnitsky sanctions. And somebody said to him, you know, aren't these sanctions against Russia? He said, no, these are pro-Russian sanctions. They're sanctions on behalf of the Russian people because the uh, Russian government not only is engaging in impunity, but is rewarding those who that have been involved in violations like in the killing of Sergei Magnitsky. These will bring these individuals to account and it will combat the culture of impunity. So it's on behalf of the Russian people that you impose these sanctions. And it's on behalf of the Canadian people in order to protect them from these acts that are being committed by those engaged in the cultures of criminality and corruption wherever they take place. Sometimes it can be a bit of a challenge to fully comprehend the role that Canada should play in respect of a particular country. There are obviously so many different concerns around the world and different issues to respond to. Now, there's no doubt unanimous support in our parliament for actions to respond to China's genocide against the Uyghurs or its violation of international law in Hong Kong. And there was certainly all party support for action to hold Myanmar accountable for its genocide against the Rohingya. But in other cases, we haven't seen that same consensus. So on Canada's role in responding to Venezuelan dictator Maduro's human rights abuses and attacks on democracy, NDP member Nikki Ashton criticized Canada's role in so-called imperialist regime change, suggesting we've in some way been subservient to the United States. Now, it's clear to me that Maduro lacks legitimacy, has engaged in systemic torture and attacks on democratic institutions. But in other cases, I mean, there are fairer and perhaps similar questions to be asked of Canada's role in Bolivia. You've always been drawn to international affairs, both inside and outside of Parliament. So how can one, as an individual parliamentarian, best get to the bottom of some of these issues and be a better advocate? Yeah, I I think we we have to approach this as best we can through a human rights lens and through the protection that sometimes sounds more like a slogan than substance when we talk about the rules-based international legal order. But Venezuela is a a clear case study of where Canada has played a, a distinguishable role, distinguishable from the United States, and a role which has exemplifies important leadership here. And Christia Freeland, while she was foreign minister, was at the forefront of that. Let me just give a, a quick snapshot. I was a member of what was referred to as the independent panel of legal experts established by the Organization of American States who were established in 2017 to look into whether there were reasonable grounds to believe that crimes against humanity were being committed in Venezuela. Uh, After our inquiry 
We had public hearings. We examined all the witness testimony. You found seven cases, right? Seven cases where there were reasonable grounds to believe that crimes against humanity were being uh, committed, which in included multiple cases of, of murder and extrajudicial executions, uh, torture, where Justice Ventura, Manuel Robles Ventura, a member of our group, said it was one of the worst cases of torture he had ever seen. But one of the most egregious things and one of the most painful things was state-orchestrated humanitarian suffering, the weaponization of food and medicine and targeting members of the opposition to those believed to be members of the opposition withholding food and medicine. Now, some six months after we produced our report, Seven countries, led by Canada and Christian Freedom at the time, made the first ever collective referral of a state party to the International Criminal Court, Venezuela, which was a state party, to the ICC for prospective investigation and prosecution. Regrettably, three years later, such an investigation has yet to be opened. And this was not the United States. I know sometimes this has turned into a kind of ideological uh, issue socialism. America. These were Germany and France and Latin American states like Peru and Canada was part of this, made the first ever collective referral. I think we need to revisit that. Number two, we should consider taking a case uh, to the International Court of Justice because Venezuela has been engaged, as I said, in egregious acts of torture. They're a state party to the torture convention. There's an opportunity here with regard to the International Court of Justice. Magnitsky sanctions were another targeted use of of sanctions against individuals rather than uh, the different kinds of sanctions that the U.S. may have been adopting with regard to Venezuela. So I think that we need to bring together here international coalition. A statement was released just August 14th that included some of the members of the Lima group, some of the contact group, the European Union, and others to put forth a blueprint for the transition to democracy in Venezuela through free and fair election. And I'm hoping that the international community will seize on this blueprint so we can put an end to the human suffering and we can move forward on behalf of the Venezuelan people. The story that was told in the recent note that you sent to parliamentarians about the judge who has been persecuted for the last 11 years and most recently has been arrested again for spiritual corruption, one among many examples of endemic attacks on the rule of law, and you probably read so many of these profiles, but it's shocking every time you read one of them. Her case is a particularly shocking case of, of the brutality of torture inflicted by the Maduro regime on a sitting judge and then using the torture that they in, inflicted on her as a warning lest others in the judiciary seek to, in effect, uh, act in any independent manner. Justice Afuni did nothing other than uh, acquit somebody who had been wrongfully convicted. For that, she herself was arrested, tortured in detention, and this became known as the Afuni effect. We heard this in witness testimony while we were holding our hearings of our legal panel at the time, where judges, as I mentioned, were warned, prosecutors were warned, if you do and, and seek to act as Judge Afuni did, you will end up like she will, namely tortured. And so we had a case uh, with regard to Leopoldo Lopez, who was a leader of the Democratic opposition in Venezuela, and he was, you know, arrested and convicted of trumped up charges. Well, when we came to our hearing, a judge came before us because she had escaped from Venezuela. She was now in Toronto. And she said to us, I issued a false arrest warrant with regard to Leopoldo Lopez because I was warned that I would suffer what Judge Afuni suffered if I didn't issue uh, the warrant. The prosecutor in the case of Lopez, Franklin Neves, who also escaped, said that he uh, issued false and trumped up charges against Lopez because he was warned what would happen to him if he didn't. So the assault on the rule of law in Venezuela is really an assault on all aspects of the judiciary, parliamentarians who themselves were arrested and so on. So we have to do what we can to transition, as you mentioned, the free and fair elections so that we can restore the rule of law, an independent judiciary, democratically elected parliamentarians, etc. in Venezuela. And you mentioned Minister Freeland and the strong Canadian response in Venezuela. Well, sometimes international affairs can be quite frustrating and you feel like you aren't moving things forward as quickly as you might like. On Venezuela, we've been quite strong. And also on Myanmar, I think Canada took a strong leadership role with initially the report from now uh, Ambassador Ray, but continued response from Parliament in, in the wake of that to offer 
financial assistance, but also to take action legally as well. Under her leadership at the time, we moved forward on a number of fronts. One that we haven't spoken about, which was quite revealing, both about the action or inaction by the community of democracies. Some two years ago, almost to the day that we're speaking now, Christian Freeland, then the foreign minister, tweeted a call for uh, the release of the imprisoned Saudi blogger Raif Badawi and for his sister Samar Badawi. The Saudi authorities erupted in fury at the time. They I recalled their ambassador from Canada. They expelled the Canadian ambassador to Saudi Arabia. They suspended all trade and investment. They withdrew some 15,000 students who were studying in Canada, which was really a self-inflicted wound. But the reason I'm mentioning this is because not one democracy came to Canada's defense. And two months later, uh, we had the brutal murder of Jamal Khashoggi. And in, in other words, it was the silence of the democracies that, that enabled uh, MBS, Mohammed bin Salman, to feel that he could act with Im impunity. And that's why it's important for the democracies not to be silent, but to work in concert after the brutal murder of Khashoggi that did serve as a wake-up call for a time, particularly in the American Congress and, and, and Senate, which then enacted sanctions, etc. But as we are speaking, uh, Saudi Arabia, the three things that we should take note of in terms of our action. Number one, uh, Canada is going to be hosting the Global Media Freedom Conference. We should be bringing up the case of, of, of Badawi and the women human rights uh, defenders there. Second, Saudi Arabia is a candidate for election to the Human Rights Council. Those elections uh, require that those who are elected are, are those who are in fact promoting and protecting human rights. And finally, Saudi Arabia is chairing the next meeting of the G20. Well, they shouldn't be able to come to the G20 20 without us addressing accountability on the part of Saudis for these human rights violations uh, that we've been referencing now. It, it is absurd that you would have a country like Saudi Arabia, and you mentioned Badawi as, as one example, but there are so many others, and that a country like that would, would sit on a human rights committee at the UN. It, it undermines the entire enterprise. Yeah, I mentioned Badawi, and not only because he's been one of the main political prisoners that our Wallenberg Center has taken up, but because his wife and three children are Canadian citizens. They had come to Canada as refugees. They've gotten Canadian uh, citizenship, so there's a clear case here. I even think of Canada maybe giving Badawi, and we've done these things in the past, honorary citizenship, which would underpin our call for his release and our standing in that regard. And then in some cases, you, you throw up your hands and you say, well, what can Canada do? And in the case of Belarus and the protests, and obviously Putin's now, and Russia is actively involved, and we've seen our minister make statements on the subject. But in, in some cases, absent the human rights violations and the Magnitsky Act framework that can be brought to bear, it's hard to know what to call for and what to do in some cases, other than to express condemnation or, or, or public criticism. Well, one of the problems is that we haven't had American leadership with regard to protecting and promoting democracy and human rights and, and exemplifying how that can be done. Regrettably, through the years of the Trump administration, we have seen the U.S. itself not only withdrawing from its responsibilities with regard to a rules-based international order, but in, in, in fact trafficking with some of the dictators themselves through Trump and at the same time sowing division uh, within and amongst the allies. So I think part of the problem has been the not only absence of American uh, leadership, but frankly, the rather prejudicial role that has been played by the American president these last four years, which has politicized and polarized and undermined the work of the community of democracies and the U.S. acting as a leader in that regard. The Wallenberg Center also has called for an independent investigation into anti-Black racism and policing in the United States. But when we look inward in Canada. In the document you sent around, you noted country by country, and in the Canadian context, highlighted human rights considerations as they relate to Indigenous people in Canada, and obviously a very dismal historical record. I've recently spoken to Senator Sinclair, and the truth and reconciliation effort, while slower than he would like, is a a serious effort in a way that it hasn't been historically in this country. And I wonder when we look internally 
if you would point to particular action items, whether it's on indigenous rights or other legislative actions that we could take to strengthen the human rights response within our own borders so that we have an even more powerful voice when we look beyond our borders. We should finally sign on to the, and become a party to the Declaration, International Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And we need to have a broad-based framework with regard to appreciating the whole issue of uh, indigenous justice. I mean, when I was Minister of Justice, I tried to propose what I call the seven R's of indigenous justice with recognition of the uh, Aboriginal people as the first inhabitants of our country as the first R. The second R being respect for their traditions, their language, their culture, their own indigenous legal system. The third being a redress for past harms, and including the residential school system and separation of children. The fourth being what I call the double entendre of uh, representation. In other words, combating the over-representation of indigenous people as inmates and the like, and the under-representation of indigenous peoples as, as judges, law enforcement, etc. The fifth was R was responsiveness. That, for example, if we engage in, in environmental development, etc., we've got to do this with the informed consent, and that was the importance, therefore, of responsiveness to the indigenous peoples themselves in this kind of consultation. I said if we did the first five R's, we'd get to the sixth R, which would be reconciliation, and that would bring us to the seventh R, which would be renewal. With regard to the African-Americans, as they are called in the States, but Black Canadians and people of color uh, here in Canada, again, when I was Minister of Justice, we had a national justice initiative against racism and hate, and I was speaking about this with Peter Flagel, who's the executive director of our anti-racism secretariat. And I said we needed to go back to that kind of an action plan with respect to combating systemic discrimination against blacks and people of color with an action plan for that purpose, where the issues of police reform would be an important but only one part of that action plan. I do think it's all the more important when we are going to be a voice for human rights on the world stage, or for any democratic country for that matter that espouses respect for the rule of law and, and for individual and human rights, that we ensure we do everything we can at home to respect those rights, to then ensure integrity and credibility on the world stage. I mean, we, we saw the Prime Minister at the United Nations saying we have to do better for our Indigenous peoples. and. I, I wish those justice policies that you're speaking of had, had carried the day beyond your tenure as justice minister. My last question, when, you, when I run down the list of constituent concerns that we receive, and in Beaches East York, we do have quite an active number of constituents on international affairs who have written to us about the Uyghurs, certainly who have written to us about Saudi Arabia and, and Badawi. And a number of emails we receive are on an issue which I'm sure you've been asked too many times to count, but when you look at Israel and Palestine, and we get emails with different views, I mean, you come at it from a kind of an interesting perspective in some ways, where your daughter is obviously very involved in the politics there, and you yourself have been chaired the Canadian Jewish Congress. On the flip side, Nelson Mandela, who you have such a strong connection with, his grandson has drawn a connection between South Africa and some of the policies of today, where he says, Madiba once called the question of Palestine the greatest moral issue of our time and yet the world remains silent. Again, for a parliamentarian, it's easy for me to say the settlement policies are contrary to international law and, and, and should stop. I remember attending Canadian Civil Liberties Conference when I was a student well before politics and listening to an, an Israeli human rights lawyer speak about some of the mistreatment of Palestinians in the West Bank and the ID card system and the transit systems that were different for Palestinians. And at the same time, we have obviously incredibly strong relationship with Israel and for good reason because they are a democracy in the Middle East. Apart from saying settlement policies are contrary to international law and we support a two-state solution, is there a way at getting at this conversation usefully from Canadian parliamentarians' perspective? Yes, I was a long time supporter of the notion that Palestinians have not only a right to self-determination but a right to uh, an independent state long before it became fashionable to take that position. But I also had always said, right to an independent, but free, democratic, rule of law, rights protecting state. The Palestinian people deserve what we seek on behalf of other peoples elsewhere. Namely, they deserve to have a freely elected uh, parliament, leadership, and the like. And so when I adopted and spoken of a two-state solution, I think that's an idle slogan. I think what we need are two states for two peoples. We need a mutual acknowledgement by these two peoples 
of each other's legitimacy. And at the same time, we need two democratic, safe, and secure rule of law states side by side. You know, I would have long standing meetings with President Abbas, president of the Palestinian Authority, and we were meeting several times a year for years until about 2014 when I sort of said, look, it doesn't appear that you're yet ready to recognize the principle of two states for two peoples acknowledging each other's legitimacy and having fair elections in the Palestinian Authority. So I think these are things we have to make calls on Israel and hold them accountable. We also have to make calls on the Palestinian Authority leadership and hold them accountable. We can't give them a free pass because then that's the kind of soft bigotry of low expectations. But if we think of the Palestinian people, keep that at the forefront, then we will do what we can, which we seek to do elsewhere, whether it be in Belarus or otherwise. We should call for the protection of democracy, human rights, and rule of law for the Palestinian people as we seek to ensure that that continues to be the situation in Israel. And not to criticize the right of the state of Israel to exist, which is obviously uh, described 2009 as a new anti-Semitism and an easy way for people to move away from criticizing an individual, a Jewish individual to criticizing the, the right of a collective to exist together. It seems so intractable. I, I take your point to call for two states for two peoples and call for free, fair, democratic elections in the state of Palestine. And then I guess just to be firm with international law as it is to say, and settlements get in the way of that and to call on Israel to, to back away from that and that rhetoric from Netanyahu sometimes to back away from that. Is that the most useful kind of advocacy then? We, we once had a, a debate in the Canadian parliament on, on the issue regarding anti-Semitism, Israel, the Middle East and, and the like. And I recall one of the closing uh, statements I made in that parliament when I was asked by one of the members of the Bloc Québécois at the time of that criticizing Israel was anti-Semitic. I said, no, criticizing Israel is not anti-Semitic and saying so is wrong. And one can be critical and seriously critical yeah. of policies and practices in Israel, and not be labeled anti-Semitic and criticized as we would any other democracy. And I was very critical of the proposed application of Israeli law now or annexation. And I'm glad that that's off the table. I said, but singling Israel out for selective opprobrium and indictment, uh, denying Israel's right to exist or worse, calling for its destruction is discriminatory, hateful, and uh, anti-Semitic, and not saying so would be dishonest. So I think on the one hand, uh, we can certainly engage in serious critiques of the policies and practices of Israel as we do of any other uh, democracy, but that's distinguishable from, as I say, selectively singling it out for a program and indictment or denying its right to- Which does happen at international fora. Well, you mentioned the, the UN Human Rights Council before, and I, I've appeared before the, the council, and one of the disturbing things I found is that there's one agenda-specific item that singles out Israel for selective opprobrium even before the hearings begin. There's an item which speaks to Israeli violations of human rights in the occupied area of Palestine. And then there's another agenda item, human rights violations in the rest of the world. So one country only is singled out for an agenda specific indictment even before the hearing begins, a kind of Alice in Wonderland situation where conviction and sentence are passed before uh, the hearing. And this is under the auspices of the UN Human Rights Council. So. We need to, again, here to have equality before the law, equal treatment, equal protection of all countries within the UN human rights system as well. I think that's right. I would add one caveat just to say, I think there ought to be a double standard for democracies insofar as I think we should hold ourselves to a higher standard. And so just as we ought to criticize ourselves if we have continued mistreatment of indigenous people and we ought to self-reflect on how we can improve our truth and reconciliation moment, I don't expect much of Saudi Arabia as far as human rights considerations go. I do expect more of Canada, just as I expect more of Israel, because of the values that we that we espouse and, and that we hold and that we defend. I agree. Petitioners must come as best as but with clean hands. Exactly. You know, you, you can't be petitioning in the international arena if you're not doing something to protect the issues of human rights in your own home. Exactly right. And, and all the more reason for us to double down on our domestic efforts, which will then lend greater credence right. to our international efforts. And on those international efforts and domestic efforts, frankly, I very much respect 
the continued work of the Wallenberg Center. And it certainly makes our jobs easier in many respects as parliamentarians who care about human rights to have someone like yourself and the staff that you surround yourself with, incredible people, who are calling attention to specific issues. I did not know about the judge in Venezuela until you brought it to my attention, that calling for a campaign of parliamentarians to take on particular political prisoners across party lines, I think is an incredibly thoughtful and impactful idea. Well, if I may, there's just one political prisoner this case and cause we've taken up, but who deserves urgent mention, and that's uh, Nasreen Sutada in Iran, an iconic human rights lawyer in Iran who's gone down the line for women in Iran, for journalists, for environmentalists, for juveniles destined for execution, for religious minorities, etc., for other political prisoners, until she herself became a political prisoner. Uh, she was convicted and sentenced, it's astonishing, a woman in, in her mid-50s over a year ago to 38 years in prison and 148 lashes, a virtual death sentence. As we are speaking, she is on a hunger strike. It's not the first of its kind that she's held for other political prisoners who are themselves at risk because of the Iranian prison. So she deserves all our support because, as I said, she's putting not just Alive that she's been putting her life on the line for others, and the least we can do is to uh, support her in her case and cause. I, I really appreciate all your work, and I appreciate your time, and I look forward to many more conversations. <laughs> Same here, Nate. And just last footnote that it's the young people at our Rao Wallenberg Center, the people who are uh, in their 20s, who are doing the work in the trenches. It's the young interns. They're the ones who are making things possible, and they give hope to us more elderly and point us in the right direction. Thanks for joining us on another episode of Uncommons. Remember to subscribe at uncommons.ca for future episodes and recommend future guests and topics on social media at BEYNA.